Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Reuse, a triple bottom line solution. My name is Athena Lee Bradley. I am with the Northeast Recycling Council. With us today are a number of exciting presenters, and I will introduce them as they come on to present. I wanted to go over a few things. One is that we have been working uh, for a couple of years now on a USDA project to do reuse. We are coming out with a reuse guide and a bunch of case studies. And all of our resources, along with the webinars and presentations and such, are on our website. And I'll give you a link to that in a bit. So how to participate today. We really would like you to ask questions. If there are questions that we as uh, organizers can answer, we will do so via the box. And how you ask a question is via the box. So put, write, write, type in the question. And then at the end of the presentations, we will set about to answer all of the questions with the panelists. Also, I would like to ask you to complete the survey. It's a very short answer survey, three questions, um, at the end of the webinar. And you also will receive a link via another uh, email that you will get tomorrow so that if you don't have time today after the webinar, maybe you can complete it then. It just helps us for our USDA grant and uh, giving us some other information about the additional resources that might be beneficial. Okay, so um, I am going to go ahead and start. And our first presenter today is Colleen. And Colleen is with, hang on a minute. Uh, Colleen is, works at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency in Resource Management and Assistance Division. She's been working on reuse in the state of Minnesota as part of her job since 2010. Okay, are you there, Colleen? I'm here. Good. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for attending today's webinar, and I'm excited to talk with all of you today, especially about reuse and knowing that all of you are so interested in the topic. Um, I'm going to start out with just a little bit of background on uh, Minnesota and our solid waste system. And for some reason, Athena, it's not letting me advance the slides right now. Uh, try the arrow, try clicking on the presentation and then move your arrow keys. All right, thank you, that worked. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, or the MPCA, is the main environmental agency that regulates, enforces, and provides assistance in, to Minnesota businesses and residents. Uh, Minnesota has a solid waste management tax on most of our waste, but we do not have a solid waste management tax on recyclables or compostables. And our tax is also excluded from industrial and construction and demolition waste. The money that's collected from this tax is used to fund solid waste staff and programs at the state level, as well as our state's closed landfill program. A portion of the money is passed through to the counties in the state to work on solid waste. Our counties develop solid waste management plans that include how the county will ensure waste is managed properly and that all efforts will be taken to manage waste in accordance with the waste management hierarchy. The counties are also responsible for meeting the state's recycling goal of 75% in the greater Minneapolis-St. Paul area, and then 35% for the rest of the state. Uh, both the counties and the state have worked on waste reduction and reuse for several years. The state began developing programs for waste reduction in 2000, and most of our efforts were focused on targeted items such as office paper, non-toxic cleaning kits, and then junk or unwanted mail. These programs were fairly successful, uh, but they were expensive, and one of the hardest things to do was to measure and track these programs. So, it, and it, one other thing that became clear to us was that we needed to separate when we talked about reuse and waste prevention from recycling and disposal. Whenever reuse and reduction were talked about at the same time as recycling, the focus always became, well, how do I recycle this? 
So we didn't want people to just be thinking about what they were going to do with their trash once they'd already created it or had it in their hand. Instead, it became apparent that we needed to talk to people about how to reduce their impact at the point of consumption, either before or during their shopping trips. So the MPCA shifted the focus from talking about ways to reduce solid waste and how to, to how to reduce your environmental impact, especially related to overall consumption. The agency ended up focusing on two big projects or programs, and these two programs are reducing the impact of products purchased from government agencies and promoting shopping, reuse, repairing products when possible, or renting instead of buying, which is what we'll focus on today. And one other note, while reuse, repair, and rental are all very different activities, in this presentation, I have them lumped together, and I will refer to them as the reuse sector for uh, that's how the PCA has kind of classified those three things together now. The first program, or the first thing I'm going to talk about today, uh, once we chose reuse as a priority, what we needed to determine was the economic activity associated with the reuse industry in Minnesota. There were a few reasons for doing this, and the biggest one was that we were always getting the same questions time after time. Well, what will happen to our economy if everyone starts to purchase reused items instead of purchasing new items? Won't it ruin Minnesota's economy? Why would you want to do that? And if local manufacturers lose money, won't that result in people in Minnesota also losing their jobs? We wanted to make sure we answered these tough questions. So in 2011, we conducted a study on reuse in Minnesota and what its economic activity was. Our first order of business for the study was to determine what would count as a job in the reuse sector. So for instance, we would include repair jobs, but we would not include things like an oil change or a transmission fluid flush for a car, standard things that everybody should be doing anyway. A company that sells both new and used items could be included, but we would apportion a percent of their sales based on phone calls or research, so we would exclude the new sales portions of their business. The sales and employee numbers in our study are likely underestimating the reuse sector's economic activity because the data set excluded material reuse industries, part-time employees, person-to-person -person transactions such as garage and online sales, and the sales of privately owned franchises of chain stores. Their full-time employees were counted, but their sales and economic data were not. We purchased business information by sector from Dun and Bradstreet, which gave us the number of employees within each business type. And after quality checking the data and applying percentages for different sectors, we used a model called the Regional Economic Models, Inc., or REMI, to determine the economic activity for reuse. The study was very informative. We learned that while these jobs aren't always the highest paying jobs, they employ over 45,000 people in the state full time. Repair jobs were the highest paying jobs in the sector, as well as the highest in overall number of jobs. Economists were quick to point out that these jobs and organizations kept money within the local economy and were also located throughout the state, not just in large metropolitan areas, so they offered employment opportunities everywhere. We also had two other main takeaways from the study. The first is that the reuse sector did contribute to Minnesota's economy, and secondly, that there was a lot more to the sector than just the traditional thrift stores that most people were thinking about when reuse was mentioned. Um, we recently completed the second, second economic activity study for Minnesota just this last year. And it's really hard to compare economic activity from one year to another, especially since the economic data is generated using a model. However, the number of jobs in the sector was almost exactly the same from the first study to the second study. And the economic activity in 2015 did increase in overall wages, tax revenue, and sales. You can see the numbers up on the slide. And if you uh, want to look at our old economic study, it's at the PCA's website. The next thing that we did, now that we knew that the reuse sector contributed to our economy, we realized that this sector was so huge, it needed the opportunity to, opportunity to network and collaborate with one another. Learning that the reuse sector was so huge and they didn't have any way to communicate seemed like a big problem. So the MPCA, which has a grant round almost every year, uh, made sure that this was a priority topic for our grant round in 2010. We provided funding for the reuse sector 
to start their own networking group. And you're going to hear more about that from Stacy White in a little bit. But I just want to mention that this reuse network has now been in existence in some format since late 2010, and it's been instrumental in lending a voice to reuse and allowing the reuse industry to network with one another. It's also increased the amount of reuse that has been happening in Minnesota because one business might have realized that they are getting things that they don't want, but now they're able to communicate to another business that does want those items, so they're able to exchange more items overall. In 2010, the PCA also began to work on a way for the reuse sector to report their environmental benefits. Our economic report did not look at environmental impacts at all. It was strictly focused on the economic impacts. We knew from studies and some life cycle analysis reports that not all reuse is good for the environment. For instance, we know that certain items that have a big impact in the use phase of the life cycle can sometimes increase the environmental impact over time when compared to purchasing a new item. An example would be an older car that gets poor gas mileage might be better off uh, getting recycled than being reused with the advances in the average miles per gallon driven for a newer vehicle. We wanted to create a way for the reuse sector to report on what they were reusing. And as the state environmental agency, we could calculate the environmental impact and report on that. So again, we used our grant program to award funding to organizations to start working on the measurement of environmental impacts. We had a thrift store uh, keep track of the average waste of the items that went in and out of their store. We also had PCA staff and members from the newly formed Minnesota Reuse Organization offer to weigh and report to the MPCA average waste of items. The National Reuse Alliance was also very helpful in supplying waste. Working with all of these people and searching online, we were able to pull together a list of more than 225 items that are being entered into a database for people to easily select and put their uh, and enter into, in their measurements. Most members of Reuse Minnesota have agreed that they will be willing to report these numbers in the database yearly so that the MPCA can use life cycle assessment tools to try and calculate envir environmental benefits from these reuse transactions. The database isn't quite built yet, but this is a very small snapshot of what it will look like when it's done. Businesses will have the option to enter in waste and sales information just by clicking on drop-down boxes, which we're hoping will be very easy for them to do. Uh, there are a few tools that will allow us to use sales information to find environmental impacts if that's all that the business can supply. And then real quickly, I'm going to show, um, we worked with the state of Washington where the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency supplied the state of Washington that has their own uh, in, uh, economic input calculator, um, we, we gave them the weights and the items from a local store that had all their used items uh, that they sent to us. And the Washington State Department of Ecology ran them through a life cycle assessment tool. Um, we had to play around with it. It's not an exact science, but it did provide us with an opportunity to see if this was even possible. And as you can see, we were able to come up with a, at least a range. Uh, it's not because these tools are usually meant to work with retail sales data and not necessarily to use retail sales data, that's why we went with a range because we know that the overall cost of a shirt um, used can be as little as a dollar, whereas sold at retail, it would be much higher. So it provided us the opportunity to see that this data can be gotten from uh, either sales or weight information, which was good. The other part of reuse that we have started to work on is the promotion of purchasing reuse. Government has been pretty good about reminding citizens to donate usable items instead of throwing them away. But the MPCA decided that it was also important for the economy and the environment to create an easy way for people to find places to shop for those used items. If we weren't completing the loop, reuse wasn't happening. So again, we made it a priority in our grant round to fund a project that would create a website that is easy to locate places to drop off items for reuse as well as to shop for those items. Uh, this is also going to be talked about a little bit later and it's not complete yet, but this website will um, allow people to kind of in this lower corner, you can see it, it allows you to say what you want to do if you want to shop used, if you want to uh, donate something for consignment, and then you can put in the parameters of where you'd like to look for those items and you'd be able, it'll tell you exactly where those, 
those uh, businesses are and what they will take or what they sell. So we're hoping it will be very easy to use. Finally, I just want to make it clear that our grant round has been instrumental in helping us work on several of these projects. There are a few smaller grants that I haven't talked about um, in much detail today that I'll just mention briefly. Um, and you can contact me if you'd like more information. But the first is a grant that looked at the life cycle impacts, including cost and water use of reusable utensils and bowls compared to compostables and disposables in a school cafeteria. For the reusable utensils, not only was it a huge win environmentally, but the school would save money on utensils within the first year. Another project was to increase reuse on campus when students were moving in and out in fall and uh, spring after the semesters ended. And Todd will be talking about that project in more detail as well. And finally, an ongoing grant right now is looking at what would happen if a permanent storage uh, facility and increased staff and somebody to do measurement were available to locate uh, at a material recovery center, but that increased the, number, the amount of things being reused. And so far, it has been very successful. So in closing, um, I'd like to mention again that these are the main reuse projects we're working on at the state level in Minnesota, but the counties, cities, universities, and other organizations are doing some of the really interesting things, and our projects would not be able to happen without them. So thank you for your time today, and I'll be happy to take questions at the end of the webinar. Thank you so much, Colleen. That is wonderful. Okay, and save up your questions, everybody, and remember to type your questions uh, inside the question box. Okay. Next up, we have Nancy Lowe. Nancy works on waste reduction and recycling for Hennepin County's Department of Environment and Energy. Uh, in addition to coordinating uh, the Fix It Clinic program, uh, Nancy works on the Business Recycling Grant program and focuses on reducing the amount of food being wasted. Nancy, are you there? Yep, here. Hi everyone, thank you for being here. Thanks, thanks Athena. Um, a little bit about Hennepin County. Sorry. Hennepin County is the most populous county in Minnesota with about 1.1 million residents and includes the city of Minneapolis. And I'm going to talk about um, the county's Fix It Clinic program. Program started in September of 2012. We have one uh, free event every month in different cities around the county. And the way it works is that you bring in your broken item and we have volunteers who have various skills and they're available um, to help you. It's different than a repair shop where you just take your item in and then you pick it up and you don't know what was involved in fixing it. You're actually um, supposed to actively participate in taking it apart, figuring out what's wrong, and um, hopefully fixing it. A lot of people are intimidated by thinking about you know, opening something up, but it helps if you have a volunteer who's there looking over your shoulder and working on the project with you. And we found that people are motivated to come by, um, based on different reasons. Some want to save money, some don't want to waste resources, and most people just don't want to throw that thing away because they believe it can be fixed. And um, the overall thing that I found of the multiple benefits for the program is that it's really fun. People enjoy coming, they learn new things, they feel empowered, um, the volunteers are building connections and building community among themselves. And uh, we've even had a few uh, relationships, romantic relationships, come out of the Fix It Clinic. So we can even sometimes have love connections. So that's pretty cool. Um, there was a woman in Amsterdam named Martine Postma. She was the one who started the program. They're called Repair Cafes over in Europe. And they're going on throughout Europe and also in the United States. Um, some of the cities are the San Francisco Bay Area, um, New York City, Seattle, Portland, 
um, to name a few besides us. We work on um, household appliances, small things where there aren't repair shops for things such as blenders, toasters, sewing machines, fans, and we also have um, three volunteers at each fix-it clinic who help people with their mending and sewing so you can learn how to darn your socks and replace a zipper. Um, some of the more unique things that we've gotten through the doors are some antique toys. There was a pig that flipped an omelet in a frying pan and once that was repaired, the woman was just ecstatic. She just went around hugging everybody because it was a sentimental toy for her and it, I think it had not been working for seven to ten years and so she was really happy to have that fixed and there are lots of good stories like that. There are antique radios that have been brought in and a lot of sentimental items that people have just, you know, it's just been sitting around in their house and they haven't known how to fix it. So. So once you come in, we check you in, we take a description of your item, and um, we weigh it, and we figure out what, we ask you what the problem is with it. Then you get paired with a volunteer who has that particular skill set. You know, maybe your toaster isn't getting power to it, or only one side of it works. So based on the symptoms with your item, that's who you get paired with. And then, like I said, you're um, expected to participate and learn about your item. And then we weigh everything and we figure out what we were able to divert from the waste stream and then we have people fill out a survey when they're leaving so they can give us feedback about their experience. And we've had 42 events so far. Like I said, one is held each month and we have a pretty good fix rate, about 77% um, overall. And this is just a snapshot of some of the feedback that we've gotten from people. Um, people are just really happy to find out what was wrong with their item, fix it if possible, but sometimes even if it can't be repaired, at least they know what was wrong with it, whether um, you know the cost of the part to fix it was worth it or not. So we have a lot of people who are very happy. And we have a lot of great volunteers, so that's um, a huge part of why people are so satisfied. And here's some happy people. We do encourage kids to come. Um, kids are naturally inquisitive. They love to take stuff apart. They're curious about how stuff works. And at home, they're kind of told, you know, don't open that up. Don't, don't take it apart versus here at the Fix-It Clinic. Not only are they allowed to do that, they're encouraged to kind of cultivate that natural curiosity and who knows, maybe they become a fixer, you know, in their adult life. A big uh, part of the reason why I'm so happy with this program is that the volunteers really enjoy it and they look forward to it every month. They've got it on their calendars. Um, they really enjoy working with each other and figuring out um, how to solve problems. They, they come because they like to fix stuff, but I think they keep coming back because they have a lot of positive experiences helping the people and they like it so much that they bring in their friends to also volunteer, their family members, their neighbors, their coworkers. So they sort of spread that through word of mouth and you know, if you're volunteering for something and you think it's really worthwhile that if you bring other people on, that's pretty cool. I'm just going to talk briefly about two other county reuse programs. Um, I don't oversee them, so I don't know as much about them, but I wanted to touch on them. The Choose to Reuse program involves a coupon book and a mobile app and an online directory where reuse retailers can show their repair options and their retail options. The program started in 2002. Um, last year, we had 56 businesses at 86 locations participating, and about um, 43,500 coupons were redeemed. The program ran for three months last fall. And it's just a really good way for these independent retailers who maybe don't have 
as much to spend on promotion. It's a good way for them to get their resources known. And our multifamily move out waste pilot program. Um, the pictures on the right, I think pretty much every one of us has seen the overflowing dumpster at an apartment building at the end of the month. And in an effort to address that problem and redirect some of the furniture and dishes and household items that were getting thrown out, um, we started a pilot program last year. And the county acts as the liaison between the property manager and the reuse organization. So since June of last year, the program has diverted almost 5,500 pounds. There are eight properties that are participating. And the way it works is if they are interested in joining the program, they contact the county. Then they either get a collection box or they designate a location um, on their building property where they can collect the item. The property manager encourages the residents to donate their items instead of throwing them away. And then when the collection bins get full, the property gets free pickups um, as often as they need it. And I'm happy to answer any questions, specific questions about logistics. Um, I'm hoping that some people will be interested in starting their own fix-it clinic programs in their community, and I'm happy to um, give some assistance with that. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Nancy. Okay, so a dating service at the fix-it clinic. I love that. Sounds like a That's great right. idea. Uh, okay, <laughs> so we're going to go on. We have a tag team coming up from University of Minnesota, and that is starting with Todd Tanner. He is the University of Minnesota Reuse Program Manager. He manages the university's surplus operations and leads the student-free store called Pack and Give Back every year to collect usable household items discarded by students at the end of the semester. He is also presenting the Pack and Give Back operations and results. All right, Todd, are you there? I am. Thank you, Lynn. Go ahead. As she said, my name is Todd Tanner. I'm the University of Minnesota Reuse Pro Program Coordinator, and we are a primary partner with the Pack and Give Back program. Before I start, though, I'll just give a, a shout out and a testimonial to Nancy because I found a used KitchenAid mixer once at the reuse program. Didn't work, bought it for $15, and, and uh, at her uh, fix it clinic, they were able to help me troubleshoot it, repair it, and I just made basil dumplings on Monday with that mixer. So thank you, Nancy. Her program does great things. Um, so the uh, University of Minnesota's reuse program collects surplus property from university departments across the Minneapolis and St. Paul campuses and redistributes for reuse by other university departments. And we also sell that property to the public every Thursday and the first Saturday of each month. The Pack and Give Back program is a waste reduction effort focused on diverting reusable household goods discarded by students during peak move-in and move-out times. The creation of the Pack and Give Back program started with neighborhood residents asking their council members to take action following a particularly messy move-out around Labor Day weekend in 2012. These are pictures of DCPs, or dirty collection points, that the city of Minneapolis would have to remove. As you can see from these pictures, the piles of trash were overbearing. Recyclable and reused materials were mixed in the trash. Hazardous materials were improperly disposed of. And the piles were attracting scavengers who would break open electronics to gather metals, and that would make even more of a mess. As a response to these problems, former council member Hofstad convened a task force in October of 2012. This initial meeting included neighborhood residents of Southeast Como and Marcy Homes, the most affected neighborhoods, neighborhood associations, the city of Minneapolis, and multiple university departments. For the pilot year, we focused on two neighborhoods, Marcy Homes and Southeast Como. With our geographic areas defined, we started to look for partners. 
The university has collected on campus for years. The only tweak we made to our dormitory collections were to hold the items for the free store rather than immediately donating to nonprofits. The university rehouse warehouse, reuse warehouse also agreed to host the free store. We also needed nonprofits to pick up in the neighborhoods. Hennepin County Environmental Services partnered with us in education around reuse and waste diversion to neighborhood residents. And the city of Minneapolis kept track of weights and added additional trucks when necessary. With our geographic area set and our partners on board, we established the program details. Beginning in April, the Office of Student Affairs knocked door to door to tell residents about the Pack and Give Back pilot and how they could get involved. We collected on and off campus in May. In June, more communications from the Office of Student Affairs went out to brand the program and create awareness of the upcoming free store. In August, our nonprofit partner would move through the neighborhoods ahead of the city waste collections to remove reusable items from the piles of discarded materials. This was met with mixed results in the first three years, and the city would uncover a significant amount of reusables after the nonprofits went through. In 2016, this year, we are working directly with the City of Minneapolis to collect the reusables from the DCPs, and the City of Minneapolis has agreed to transport these items to the reuse warehouse for the free store. The free store coincides with the start of the school year, and we target incoming students and encourage them to shop for no charge. After the free store, our partner collects all of the remaining materials. On campus, university crews pick up from the dorms. Reuse drivers collected clothing, food, toiletries, electronics, and furniture, while our recycling drivers collected books, cardboard, paper, and magazines. Off campus, our nonprofit partner mirrored, mirrored the city's collection routes and picked up in advance of the city's trash and recycling pickups, and also collected larger items on campus from our designated collection points. The collected materials are stored during the summer and then giving away to incoming students and residents of the affected neighborhoods. On average, the free store redistributes 20 to 25,000 pounds of materials to students and people living in the infected neighborhoods, and then donates the remainder to our nonprofit partner. Our nonprofit partners have been the Salvation Army in 2013, Bridging in 2014, and Goodwill in 2015. We are in the process of setting up Goodwill again in 2016, as they have the capacity to handle the large volume of materials that we have left over. This year, the nonprofit partner will not participate in collections on campus or from the neighborhoods because of the mixed results we've experienced in the past. Goodwill is still supporting us with a loan of several thousand hangers for the free store and rolling carts needed to collect from off-campus locations that are being added to this year's program, which include five large apartment complexes, 20 medium-sized apartment buildings, 30-plus single-family rental properties, and 30-plus Greek houses. Here are some examples of materials that have been discarded at dirty collection points by students moving out. Most of these items were just left curbside, uh, intermixed with other debris and materials, and just left. A breakdown of the 2015 materials collected and redistributed. Um, the free store took in and processed almost 25,000 pounds of materials and donated approximately 20,000 pounds back to students and residents of the affected neighborhoods. Goodwill collected a total of 12,000 pounds from their on and off campus collections and the 4,000 pounds left over at the end of the free store. The Como Recycling Center processed almost 40,000 pounds of recyclable materials during packing it back. We distributed over 600 pounds of non-perishable foods collected over 500 pounds of mattresses, recovered 54 pounds of compostable waste from the free store donations, gave away almost 600 pounds of mini fridges, and recycled another 250 pounds. In total, over the last three years of the program, we've diverted almost 200,000 pounds from landfills. And this has uh, made an impact on the communities. These are some of the things that uh, people have said 
um, one of our neighbors said, we were so impressed with the speed of the cleanup this year. There was much, much less garbage and furniture. It really sets the tone for how they view the neighborhood they live in. You are truly making this a better place to live for everyone. And a nonprofit said, huge life-changing thank you to the reuse program for a donation. You all have changed not only my life personally, but hundreds if not thousands of other lives. Your gift and organization is a gift from heaven above. Thank you. If everyone thought the way your program does, the world would be a lot better place. Thank you all very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Todd. Impressive statistics there. Congratulations. All right, so we are going on to Stacy White. Uh, Stacy is one of the founding members of Reuse Minnesota, a nonprofit aimed at connecting and creating a network for reuse, rental, and repair businesses around the state of Minnesota. Reuse Minnesota was founded in 2012, and Stacy's here to talk about starting up the nonprofit, its challenges, rewards, and results. Go ahead, Stacy. Thank you so much. Um, yes, yeah, so Rios Minnesota is a nonprofit organization that brings together reuse, rental, and repair around issues that impact businesses, both small and large, in the reuse sectors. And prior to our formation, a network did not exist to connect people around these issues. <coughs> Excuse me. Our goal is to reduce barriers to reuse wherever they are and to make it easier for individuals and businesses to make reuse happen. We work to bring visibility and awareness of the economic and environmental impacts associated with extending the life of items by reusing and repairing them. So Reuse Minnesota started as a chapter of the National Reuse Alliance, and we quickly realized that we had some strong players around the state and at our table, and that it would be beneficial for us to create a nonprofit to network our reuse rental and repair businesses in Minnesota. We decided to maintain our strong relationship with the National Alliance, but ultimately formed a nonprofit in the state in 2012. Starting a nonprofit, while it has been rewarding, has had some challenges. So a lot of our founding members hadn't formed a nonprofit before, or in some cases, hadn't worked for a nonprofit before. And it was helpful to us to have the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency as a founding member and as a continuing member, not only for grant funding that allows us to grow our network, but also to provide insight on the state's work and how we can best align our efforts to benefit our members. Another challenge that we encounter and continue to struggle with is having an all-volunteer board comprised of members who have full-time jobs and other commitments in their lives. And sometimes we find that we set out with very ambitious goals and then we have to scale back a little bit uh, because of those other commitments. And then throughout the years, on and off, we've had a part-time coordinator either paid through grants or through other programs. And that, that has really helped us keep the basics, like our, our website up and running, or making sure that membership renewals are taken care of in a timely manner. Our approach to reuse, rental, and repair is really like putting everything under one big tent. We promote textile reuse book reuse, building materials, electronics, and pretty much everything in between. We believe that if the whole reuse community supports one another, that that will lift all of reuse. So if someone buys a secondhand dress, they may think about a secondhand computer. And if they buy a secondhand computer, they may look for a secondhand fixture for the next home remodel. The types of work that we promote and work on under our tent our opportunities for our members to promote their businesses, networking and collaboration with business owners and stakeholders in the reuse sectors, and we really focus heavily on increasing the business-to-business -business reuse because that's where we see the scale uh, benefits of what we can do. And it's important in that B2B reuse 
for, for us to get items to the businesses that can best reuse them. The businesses that have the right customers to buy or to reuse items. And I'll tell you one example uh, from the University of Minnesota. So we have five campuses across uh, the University of Minnesota and one of our campuses was closing down uh, one of their libraries and had thousands of books that were destined to be sent to recycling. And we connected uh, that campus with one of our Reuse Minnesota members, A Greener Read, and put thousands of books back in to uh, Reuse, either for sale at their store or online. Uh, we address industry challenges and reduce barriers to Reuse. And we partner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency to standardize and collect data showing the reuse benefits. And that was talked about in uh, Colleen's presentation at the beginning. We call ourselves the voice of the reuse community, which historically has been silent and has been drowned out in the green jobs discussion. And a lot of people think of green jobs as just solar or wind technology. But as you know, reuse has been a green job for all of America's history. Reuse seems to play in a very bipartisan way because it's local and it's small business and it keeps our money local and it helps communities as well as the environment. Some of the events and the ways that we share our message is opportunities like uh, Minnesota Goes Green, which is a, a green fair that brings together consumers and uh, businesses. Green drinks, I think a lot of uh, states hold a green drinks and, and Rios Minnesota has taken over that green drinks at times and, and focused on giving our members a platform to promote their business. The Minnesota State Fair, I think the majority of states have a state fair but in Minnesota it's kind of like a state fair on steroids. In 2014 we had 1.8 million attendees and so for us to be able to have what we call a repair for reuse shop at the State Fair uh, is really a great way for us to get out in front of uh, people who are coming from all over the Midwest. We've tabled and participated in Junk Bonanza which is another traveling uh, reuse fair and uh, recently we've we partnered with one of the local colleges in St. Paul, Minnesota to offer up a film screening and tomorrow night, in fact, we are screening True Cost, which is a documentary about the environmental um, environmental costs of, of our fast and cheap fashion. And then uh, we also work closely and have in the past and hope to in the future uh, with the Recycling Association of Minnesota. And so that's kind of us reaching across the aisle and trying to bring together recycling and reuse. Do they belong together? That's still TBD, but we definitely think that there are some, some benefits to be had between the two. One of the things that we're very proud of is creating and serving as the voice of the Rios community for the state of Minnesota. And you may have heard about the Fair Repair Bill proposed legislation. Rios Minnesota and its members are in support of this and have been uh, since the beginning. And there are four states with a proposed bill going to legislation this March. And I've listed them here if you're interested in, in learning more. And separate from what's up on this slide, I'll also say that we're, we're, very, we're very happy to be viewed as the voice of, of reuse for the state. We recently had a state senator contact us for input on a proposed bill on the elimination of sales tax on used goods. The bill ultimately did not go anywhere, but it's great to have senators looking at reuse Minnesota to provide input or to provide support on proposed bills. We know that this happens a lot on the recycling side and so it's great to see this happening on the reuse side now too. And uh, along the same lines of what Colleen had talked, uh, talked about, one of our major projects right now is creating a website to connect buyers and sellers in all areas of reuse, rental and repair. And we were fortunate enough to receive a grant from the Pollution Control Agency. We've hired a local web development company to create a responsive website that will allow any reuse, rental or repair business to connect with buyers. Uh, one of the things that we hear from our members again and again is that uh, what's missing is a way to connect businesses and consumers. And so we're hopeful that this will be 
a solution and a step in the right direction. So that's what I have on uh, Rios, Minnesota, and I welcome your questions at the end. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stacy. All right. So our next presenter is Diane Cohn. We're going to move out of Minnesota and go into New York State. I have to say, though, before leaving Minnesota, I was at the State Fair there for tw two times, actually, and it is an awesome fair. So thank you, Minnesota. All right, Diane, are you ready? I'm ready. Thanks, Athena. Okay. Well, great. You're on. Um, this has been fascinating. It's really great to uh, see all the different efforts that are happening. Um, and uh, I'm um, coming to everybody from Ithaca, New York, the Finger Lakes region, and really happy to be representing this. We've got a small independent nonprofit organization. Let's see if I can get it least advanced. And um, what I want to talk about over the next few minutes is uh, kind of give an overview of what the what the organization is and the programs that we run, some of the uh, triple bottom line impacts that we see that we're having, and, and some some of the ways we're calculating that. And then um, we got a grant from the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute and have had a really great time with Athena and the Northeast Recycling Council offering this to other New York State communities. Um, kind of, uh, we, we were able to develop an online business plan template that we have available and I'm going to uh, kind of show people how they can access that. And while it was a New York State grant, um, sort of catered towards New York State communities as far as at least starting a nonprofit with New York State laws. It's applicable anywhere and we would love to share it. And um, So there will be information on that towards the end. So uh, Finger Lakes Reuse was formed in 2007 is when we incorporated as a 501c3 independent nonprofit organization. 501c3 means it's charitable so when you donate money or materials um, uh, they could be tax deductible depending on um, what your tax status is. Um, and when we were forming, uh, it's required that you have a mission statement. And <clears throat> in, in the Ithaca area, there are really a lot of nonprofit organizations. And to create yet another new one, we were meeting some um, skepticism and, you know, do we really need another nonprofit? And uh, so we really felt strongly that we wanted to take a strong business approach um, to developing this nonprofit organization. And a nonprofit is a little bit of a misnomer. It doesn't mean that, a, that it's a business that can't make money. It's a, it means that the, the volunteer board of directors cannot profit from the activities of the organization. So um, we wanted to really uh, be clear that we had a business approach and that we were planning to be self-sufficient and not entirely grant and um, donation dependent. So uh, by incorporating the triple bottom line, which is people, planet, and profit, um, not just profit, into our mission statement uh, to enhance community, economy, and environment through reuse, we thought that that was a, a good foundation for the organization we were trying to develop. Um, uh, and a little more tangible than the mission statement uh, are our three goals to reduce waste and poverty, create jobs, and provide job training through reuse activities. Um, and our, our vision, our long-term vision, is really to be part of what we see as a, a thriving reuse infrastructure that we'd love to uh, help encourage, and um, that's why we're sharing our model, uh, which we're calling the Community Reuse Center model. So uh, we, st uh, we had about a three-year planning process, and then we opened our first store. Um, it's called the Trip Hammer Reuse Center because it's located in a place called Trip Hammer Mall that's on Trip Hammer Road. It's just outside the city of Ithaca. And we initially um, focused on furniture, household goods, and building materials because during our planning process, those were the materials that were the least well served in our community. Uh, we had a lot of used clothing places, and we had, you know, one of the largest book sales in the country. Uh, but that's where we started. Um, I personally was very interested in getting a, a deconstruction program going, and I'll show a few pictures of that for people who aren't familiar with what that is exactly. Um, but it's basically the dismantling of whole buildings by hand. Uh, building materials are a big, big um, segment of the nation's waste stream, and so we saw that as a, a priority material that we wanted to target. And with a federal grant from the Appalachian Regional Commission, we launched that in, in uh, the following summer after we opened the Trip Hammer Reuse Center. 
Um, then we had an empty storefront next door to us in the, in the little strip mall that we started in. And at the same time, um, we hadn't initially targeted computers and electronics because there were a couple of volunteer-run programs that were happening in the community, but both of them struggled. One actually lost its lease and folded, and the other one was very interested in merging with us. And so the three of us got together and um, we're, we were able to expand into the storefront next door and we added it as a program that we called the eCenter, uh, Refurbishing Computers and Electronics. Um, and then, as uh, was mentioned earlier, repair cafes came on the scene in 2012. There was a New York Times article and um, when the fourth community member emailed me a link to that article, I was like, hmm, maybe there's some interest. And so we um, started a, a, what we call the Fixers Collective. It turns out and I, I ended up meeting the founder of the New York City Fixers Collective. Um, we accidentally stole their name, but they said that that was okay. Um, uh, so we started the Ethic Effects Fixers Collective um, in, two, in about November 2012. It meets weekly, totally volunteer run. We just give up some space, a corner of our uh, educational space, and now it's actually out in our store. Um, and uh, every Saturday afternoon from 3 to 5, community members are welcome to come bring their, their materials uh, to, to get fixed. Um, and then uh, uh, the next year, we, what we were finding with the computers coming in, that we were overwhelmed with the volume of materials coming at us, and we really didn't have the capacity to handle everything. And so we thought that we'd try to um, develop a kind of a mutually beneficial job training program that we called RESET. It stands for Reuse Skills and Employment Training Program. And so in 2013, we launched that, and we do one in technology. And we've run one in construction, and uh, we hope to do more. And then we've just developed a, another uh, track in uh, retail and customer service. So I'll tell a little bit more about that as we go. And then just uh, this past December, I'm actually sitting in our new um, Ithaca Reuse Center. So we're really excited to have opened that in December. And everybody on this webinar is invited to our grand opening in April, uh, which we're actively planning right now. So here's a few. I'm just going to buzz through a few pictures for people to see. Um, there's uh, the storefront on the left uh, was where we first opened. It's about a 7,000 square foot store inside, and then we expanded in 2010 into the um, the storefront on the right, which is about another 6,500 square feet. And uh, we've never tied the two together um, for a number of reasons, but we're hoping that um, as uh, with the second store online now, the separate one. Um, that we are going to actually put a, a brand new storefront that ties both of those together. So a, a few shots of the inside. You know, we have household goods, um, home electronics, furniture, uh, refurbished computers. We're a licensed Microsoft refurbisher. We also put uh, Linux uh, open source operating systems on, on machines. Um, all data is wiped and then we reinstall everything new. Um, and then we've got right now an internal lumber yard, but with our new expansion, we will finally have an outside lumber yard, which we're excited about. A few shots of it. This is actually an EPA funded um, deconstruction training that I have some pictures of uh, that we did post Hurricane Katrina. This house, uh, which looks perfectly good, uh, people don't realize how many buildings are demolished that are in perfectly good condition. Um, this had been damaged, uh, it had four feet of flood water, and the homeowners decided to take their insurance money and build on um, higher ground on the property. Uh, but they felt guilty about tearing it all down, so they found this EPA deconstruction training, uh, which I was able to participate in. And we took this 2,000-square-foot uh, house down in about uh, nine days. I think there were 10 to 18 volunteers on any given day. A small crew from uh, Raleigh, North Carolina's Habitat from, for Humanity deconstruction program uh, led the, the, um, the deconstruction. And so it, it's, it's a labor-intensive disassembly by hand. We didn't have any heavy equipment. We did palletized materials and we used a skid steer to load onto a flatbed truck, but, but everything else was really by hand, hand tools. A lot of lumber is generated along with trusses and siding and flooring and all sorts of other things. Um, so uh, then in 2010, we started our computer refurbishing program. Here's a shot of our, our lab. We've actually just moved our lab downtown. And this is, this is now, if you go in that store, this is now office furniture retail space that we expanded here. 
uh, here's computers that have been what we call triaged. Uh, we've, we've opened them up, we've pulled the hard drives, we've uh, jotted down uh, what kind of capacity, you know, the processing speed, what, how much RAM is in there, and then we decide, you know, can, can this handle a Windows 7 operating system or does it have less resources? Maybe we should do an open source Linux-based operating system that takes a lot less resources. Um, and then we, we quality control them and, and put them on the floor for resale. This is um, a shot of our, um, our, our educational space where we do our job training and it's, it's also where the Fixers Collective has been meeting. Um, and that's all uh, moving to our new uh, slightly bigger location. The job training program has been a real success and um, we're not really social workers, actually. Um, none of us um, plan to get into the reuse field, but uh, here we are. And but we we um, uh, by by um, offering this program to people who have um, largely been employed, we found that there's been real success um, uh, with with how people are are moving through and and progressing through and and getting jobs um, after they've worked with us. Uh, the reset technology program. We've run, I think, seven rounds now, and essentially it starts with, it's a free program, it's 10, 10, uh, 10 weeks long, um, about 20 hours a week, usually four or five hour days, uh, and that gives people space to, you know, look for other jobs, hold a part-time job, etc. At the end of that 10 weeks, they're welcome to apply for a full-time paid apprenticeship. Uh, so usually in the first round, we'll have eight to 12 participants. Um, and then we can usually afford to bring on one to two apprentices for the next 15-week uh, phase. Uh, we pay a, a, a approximately 50% of their salary and then we write grants to support the other 50%. And we've been really successful finding grant money uh, to support that. Um, and at the end of um, the whole training, if they've done the apprenticeship, they've been with us for 25 weeks, which is about six months. We've really built relationships with them. Um, what we have them do, uh, for example, in Reset Tech, is they help us you know, manage the volumes of materials. They help us pull the hard drives, wipe the data, test the components, reinstall the, the software, do the quality control checking, test the components. There's, you know, there's all the computer peripherals and wrapping and organizing the cables and all sorts of stuff like that. And in exchange, what we do is we've um, invited other employers from the community to come in and teach kind of related skills that we may not have uh, as part of our day-to-day -day activities like how to how to do networking or over-the-phone customer service and um, and it's been a great way to actually build relationships with local employers who have uh, started hiring uh, some of our um, trainees and so that's been a real success and that's something that we're looking to really continue to grow. Um, here are um, a few of our participants. Um, actually, the two people on the left are now our employees, and it's been really, uh, we've hired, we have 25 employees now. We, we're a living wage employer, uh, meaning we, um, there's a local entity that has calculated uh, what a living wage is in Tompkins County, which is where Ithaca is. And um, uh, we also offer health benefits, so, um, um, so that's it, it's been it's been great. Uh, so of the 25 employees, we uh, 11 people were formerly on public assistance, and six of them were in our job training programs. It's been a great way to get to know people and hard workers, and uh, to provide opportunities for people, uh, and also get help from them. And I think that that is the empowering factor: is that we're not saying here this is something that we are going to teach you how to do. We're saying here we need help. Um, we're going to uh, you know, give you some space to help us, but um, this person on the right, um, Nathan, he was one of our first apprentices. He ended up voluntarily writing a script that helped us test, I think it was sound cards or video cards when they weren't actually still plugged into the machine. We could just plug them in independently and see if they worked um, because he saw that as a need. Um, he's actually teaching, um, Cornell University, which is here in Ithaca, has a, a program called, called the Humphrey Fellows Program, and it's um, it's a, it's a graduate program for professionals from developing countries, so he's probably teaching a doctor and an agronomist uh, basically how to uh, work through the components of um, a, a computer that needs to be refurbished. I think they're actually disassembling uh, computers right here uh, that, that couldn't be refurbished. 
it's a great way to get to know all the parts and pieces. Um, and then for our, our construction trading program, you know, we, you learn about tools of the trade. Even though we're disassembling houses, it's construction in reverse. You still have to wear proper uh, proper gear, uh, wear safety equipment, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So you get familiar with the tools of the trade of construction. And again, you know, we hope that it can be a stepping stone into that uh, career path for people. Um, Here's a couple of tools of the deconstruction trade. These are pneumatic denailers, which are real labor-saving devices, and they're actually a lot of fun to operate. Um, here's our um, Ithaca Fixers Collective. Um, uh, uh, basically, um, we just once we decided we were going to start offering this on a weekly basis, we've said, well, we'll we'll give some table space, and I asked the uh, my coworkers to set aside any hand tools that came in. So this is the one of the first meetings on the left where we're just you know kind of marveling at uh, you know what's come through and and um, and uh, then you know a, a tool cabinet came through and so then we organized them and put them away and um, you know we've uh, we've worked through quite a number of projects. Uh, we have a, a log basically it's a Google form where we ask. Uh, I don't know if we're tracking weight. I don't think we are, but we're tracking you know what the item was and. Um, you know, was it a successful repair? We're at about a 70% uh, repair success rate, last I checked. Um, this woman, her uh, her dog ate her icicle lights, and uh, um, uh, those are um, surprisingly really complex electrical things. She had never um, worked with electricity before, and so it was actually quite the project over the course of a two-hour workshop for her to repair it, but. Um, uh, she was literally empowered at the end of this, and it's and that's what that's the experience that people have when they're working with these materials. We see this over and over and over. Uh, so this is a, a couple shots of the new building. Uh, we had a, a, a local artist uh, paint a couple of earth murals on the side, um, and uh, so that's we're hoping it kind of becomes an iconic uh, place that people will stop by. There's about 10,000 cars a day that drive by this highly visible location, and so far without even much advertising since our uh, um, uh, soft opening in December, uh, we're doing well over $1,000 a day. I think on Saturday we just had a $3,200 day, so we're really excited about that. Um, a little bit about how we evolved as an organization. Um, uh, we really tried to take an, a, a collaborative approach. Um, and I had heard Janine Benyus, who's a, a biologist, and she wrote a, a book called Biomimicry 2.0, and another book listed here. Um, she, she, she said that, um, you know, we're kind of conditioned to think that competition prevails in nature, survival of the fittest, etc. Um, but when in fact she uh, goes on to argue that collaborative systems are far more prevalent, far more healthy. Um, and I think that there's a, kind of a paradigm shift happening where, um, you know, I would really encourage people to, as they're writing their business plans, um, you know, one of the components of a business plan is uh, to do a competitive analysis. But um, we uh, encourage uh, looking at a collaborative analysis. What partners could you work with? You know, and, and thinking outside of the box. I mean, even Ernst and Young here is is uh, is picking up um, on this collaborative approach. And so, uh, I, I think the spirit of that and the, the reuse community across the country, and the, the 15 years of conferences I've been going to with the Reuse Alliance and the Building Materials Reuse Association. Uh, they've got a deconstruction conference coming up um, later this month in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and, uh, t you know, I, I really think that sharing information like uh, all the people from Minnesota just did in this webinar is, is really a, a way to get this up and off the ground. Uh, we're working with a St. Vincent de Paul from Eugene, Oregon, who's helped form the Cascade Alliance, which is the lower part of this slide. Um, that's uh, they got a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to share what they're doing. They're doing reuse on a whole different scale. I encourage people to look into that and and um, and understand uh, some of the possibilities. It really opened my eyes to the fact that we could be uh, diverting, you know, semi truckloads, um, and uh, that's something that we're working towards because it, it should happen. Uh, here's a list of our local partners and. I understand that this session is uh, being recorded, so I'm going to kind of go quickly through some of this stuff, but you'll be able to go back and revisit uh, any of this information that, that you're interested in, and you can always email me. My contact info, info will be at the end. Uh, we won a few awards as we've been evolving. Uh, most recently, we're really proud to have gotten the Environmental Champion Award from the U.S. EPA. Uh, so a few of the triple bottom line 
benefits. Um, the community aspect of it, um, really, and, and I've, I've gone through a real transformation as the director of this organization. Um, it's, we've really become a people-centric as opposed to stuff-centric organization. While keeping stuff out of the landfill seemed like the reason we were doing things, we realized it's, it's human health and, and quality of life, which is, is actually the, the final reason. And so we wanted to try to make our um, organization good for the people that are working there. It turns out that working with reused materials is good quality work, and we don't even really have to do much except for be respectful and, and keep a clean and safe work environment and uh, the empowering nature of reuse and the engaging activities are, are all there. Um, these I mentioned, um, uh, our job training uh, program uh, at the beginning, um, we had 11 people who were employed out of the what was it, uh, 44 participants who have, who, the people who have been out of the program for 12 months or more, I think we've had about 70 people go through the program, but of the, of the the 44 who have been out for 12 months or more, 11 were unemployed when they, at the beginning, and 26 are now employed. So we're really excited about that 59% um, uh, employment rate. Um, here's just some pictures of people being happy reusing. Um, so also, as far as economic impact, I agree, and I, I think Minnesota um, was, it's, it's smart, uh, Colleen was saying that, um, you know, starting with the economic study and the economic impacts, I think I, I get a lot of traction talking in those terms as opposed to environmental ones. Um, uh, so the last 10 quarters, um, our trip hammer store exceeded $100,000 in sales each quarter. Uh, we expect to double that with this, this new, expanded, more visible space um, coming up this year. Um, more than double it, actually. Uh, we've we've only diverted in our, our seven years of existence. Um, it's probably closer to 2,000 tons now. I think we got that 1,500. Uh, I think we did this calculated this metric about six plus months ago. But uh, 1,500 tons at our local disposal rate of $80 a ton is about $125,000 that it would have cost the community to dispose. But we've actually sold that 1,500 tons for $2.1 million in sales. And I think it's really important for economic development people to understand the power of just that metric alone. And we've created 25 living wage jobs so far. Um, a little bit about our funding model. Uh, we're about 70% self-supporting, 60-something uh, percent. I think it's a little higher in 2015. We expect it to go down a little bit in 2016 with this expansion. But ultimately, we think we'll be 90 plus uh, percent self-supporting and, and the grants that we get will be to you know pilot new programs and uh, help support the educational stuff that we'll be doing and continuing to do. Um, one calculation I've been offering is you know if um, uh, 10 people in, in 10 communities uh, were, were moved from public assistance into living wage jobs over the course of five years it would generate about six million dollars in, in, in public money avoided public expense. Um, and if you factor in uh, the fact that they're earning a living wage, it, it increases to $16 million. And that doesn't, we weren't able to um, calculate health benefits, you know, if someone's on public assistance and they go to the emergency room, we just had no way to, to calculate that. So um, this, is, this is our slide and it's uh, somewhat informal based on interviews of the people that we had in our staff that were um, on public assistance and how much were they receiving and how much was their rent and their bus pass and stuff like that. Um, the environmental benefits, while obvious, I don't think we talk about energy enough, um, and I, I really think that there's um, probably funding and uh, people really should understand the energy impacts of reuse, that it's much different uh, than recycling, which is much more energy intensive and uh, shouldn't be lumped in as much as it is with recycling. I really think it's, um, uh, you know, obviously it might be a smaller portion of, uh, you know, the quote waste stream that we can tackle that's reusable, and yet uh, the value is there and really should be prioritized. Um, uh, the EPA has a, this is a from 2009 report um, that, it, and this is back when people more had desktop computers and now people have mobile devices so this will evolve, but um, you know, if uh, we could extend the lives of all the personal computers by 50 percent, it's 25 million metric tons of CO2 emissions would be avoided, so it's not insignificant in terms of greenhouse gas as well to do reuse. Um, this is a, a photo, this was um, the staff and volunteer meeting that we had uh, about three days before we opened our doors in December. Um, a very diverse group of people, um, economically speaking, it's just, and it's been very exciting to 
uh, be able to work side by side with people who have had less opportunity but are uh, have so much to offer and it's just been this really great kind of profound and enlightening experience. Um, so um, like I said, uh, we have on our website uh, or, uh, um, access to what we're calling the Community Reuse Center kind of online business plan template. Uh, we worked in partnership with our Cornell Cooperative Extension and their web developer to, to Hey, Diane, uh, you are breaking up there and we can't hear you. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, thank you, Athena. Um, uh, if you go to our website and give your email um, and password, you get access to everything. Um, and that's, that's all you really need to do. I'm, uh, I'm almost done with this, so I'll be it's about three, three or four more slides. Um, it, it gives you a bunch of resources that we put together, but I think the best thing is as you work through the steps and you enter into these fields, um, uh, like for example you work out what your mission statement is, when you press um, save and then you want to print, it, it prints a formatted business plan draft that you can share with partners and investors. Uh, you can print it with or without the notes. Um, and uh, we also invite other people who are more expert or, or have experiences in reuse to, to share their stories. So it's not just our story that's uh, part of this template. Um, and here's a here's a, a shot of what you know a couple of pages of what the um, uh, the business plan will look like and the table of contents that uh, that will all be kind of updated and um, part of the uh, the output of this online business plan template. So here's my contact information. Um, I welcome anyone to, to contact me, and, and thanks, Athena, and everybody at the Northeast Recycling Council for this opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you, Diane. All right, so we are going to go and uh, do questions. Mary Ann from NERC is going to ask questions. If you still have questions of the panelists, please write them into the question box and we'll do our best to get to them. And if everybody can hang on, because we do have a number of questions that I think you'll all be interested in those. Mary Ann? Yeah. You're on. Um, first, I'd like, because several people have asked, the slides and the recording from today's webinar will be posted on NERC's website. And you will receive an, uh, an email with the link to those. Um, so one of the questions, one of the first questions that came in and said, asked, how can reuse move forward if agencies push back the concept when these materials, which pass a certain specification, are not used in projects, even if they've been, even if it's been successfully demonstrated um, that they can be used in the past. And this was posted uh, just after Colleen's presentation, but I think it's open for anyone's response. Any responses, panelists? Well, I'm not sure I quite understand what the question is asking. Um, I'm not sure that our agency has said that materials should not be used. And I think that's kind of what the question is getting at. It, that's how I understand it too, that some regulators and potential users of reused materials decide not to use them in various projects, um, whether they be construction projects or in other applications. Um, so has anybody run into that same problem? Maybe well, Diane. I know in construction and dem or uh, in deconstruction, sometimes some of the uh, wood is not for safety reasons. You're not allowed to use it. Maybe that that's getting at that question. Yeah, and and um, I mean I can speak to that's lumber is a was the example I was thinking of. Um, uh, 
I've, I've attended a lot of uh, used building material conferences and deconstruction conferences, and, and um, it's, it's an issue, actually, it, it's more of an issue of perception than the reusability of materials. So, uh, for example, um, if you um, take two by fours out of a building and there's nail holes in it, it's changed the kind of engineering structure of that, of that individual two by four because you don't know where the nail holes have maybe weakened it and so you're not you know allowed to just use a two by four that was graded as a number one two by four in in a, a structural wall but you could um, there's there's a bunch of other uses for that two by four um, uh, and you can also one of the strategies for that particular issue is work with the local. You can either get a, a, a new engineering stamp, which is co cost prohibitive, or you go to your um, code inspector, building inspector, and you say, "This is what I'm planning to do. I'm going to double these up, or um, you know, look at these. There's there's only these nails, these boards were only you know toenailed, only at the very edges, and I'm actually going to trim those off, and I'm going to use this differently. There's a bunch of ways that you can be creative, but I do think that larger projects have challenges reusing materials because of the lack of kind of um, uniformity. And so it's really uh, a lot more of the market tends to be smaller, contractors, do-it-yourselfers, uh, but we can't keep lumber in stock. I mean, it just flies out and there's just, there's so many non-structural uses for dimensional, you know, in quotes, structural lumber. And so I think people um, need to keep a creative mind uh, toward how you know whether something is usable or not, and and a lot of its perception can be the barrier. Uh, and for Colleen, can you share the difference in environmental impact between water energy use for utensil reuse versus plastic throwaway utensils? Uh, I don't have that information with me right here, but if you go to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency website, the uh, there are the case study is up on our website, and it'll give you all the information on um, the water usage for both the disposable, compostable, and the reusables, and then it'll also give you energy as well as the economic data too. And I believe this next question is for you, Colleen, as well. Does the website for where and what to donate sell? only work for the state of Minnesota? So I think they're referring to the website that both Stacy and I talked about. It's a responsive website where people would type in where they would like to donate something, purchase something, or um, sell something for consignment or repair. And yes, right now it only works for Minnesota because it's only populated with businesses from Minnesota. So it's not that it couldn't work you know, that that website would not be something that another state could do. It's just that it's only populated with Minnesota businesses. And do you know of other states who have taken, undertaken similar analyses? Was that you, Colleen, or Nancy? Uh, what type of analyses are you referring I, I to? I assumed it was the economic one. I, I, I do think um, we've had, Oregon has, talk to us about doing it, so I'm not sure if they have, and I have, I think Washington, the state of Washington also uh, might have done one. And is liability a, a concern at the fix-it clinics? Um, people often ask that question. We do have the participants sign a waiver, and we also have the volunteers sign a waiver, and by, by making the person who brought the item in um, actively taking apart their their item, it's less likely that you know the liability concern is is greatly diminished if the person was actually working on it themselves. And uh, is anyone starting to use 3D printing to help with replacing older parts? Um, yes, for sure. It's just a matter of finding a 3D printer nearby. Um, there are a couple of maker spaces here in the Twin Cities that have 3D printers and they're able to um, print out different parts that might be out of stock or no longer made. Okay. And how do you find and organize the Fix-It volunteers? Um, print media and also television has been very helpful with that. They um, write stories about the program and people hear about it that way and there's a lot of word of mouth and social media that's been helpful for 
attracting volunteers as well. And then one of you talked about move out services for free. Um, so this question is for you. Does the county provide the move out service for free? Not the, well, so the program works is that the, there is a collection bin at the particular property that signed up for it. So there isn't anybody helping to move out furniture or other belongings the resident has to actually put them into the collection bin and then um, the reuse retailer picks it up for free. Mm -hmm. And then did you also mention the use of a coupon? Someone was wondering uh, uh, if you could give an example of what a coupon might be. Sure, so there is a coupon book. Um, there were 56 retailers participating so it would be for a reuse, um, a consignment store, or a Goodwill Salvation Army Value Village type of retailer. It would be for repair services, shoe repair, um, any of those retailers where their business is repairing or reusing. Okay. For the pack and give back program mentioned, who cleans the items for reuse? We don't clean or process any, any of the items. I know some other schools have followed a model where they wash and clean everything, but we put everything out as is and uh, let the responsibility of cleaning it or repairing it just fall to whoever is uh, taking it for free. And Todd, another question for you. How does the city select its nonprofit partners? Is it through a competitive procurement process? You know, the partners that are involved here at the university have just yearly sat down and had a discussion um, on it. And our, our biggest problem, though, with it is finding someone who's big enough to, to be able to support us. Um, you know, Bridging and the Salvation Army have both been great partners, but it seems from our experience that Goodwill um, just has uh, the capacity to handle more. Um, we looked at Arc Value Village this year as a possibility, but they just weren't in a position um, to, to handle the volume. We would like to continue to move it around to different partners from year to year, you know, kind of spread the wealth and not keep it in one place, but uh, their ability to, to handle the volume is, is pretty relevant. Mm -hmm. And for Diane Cohen, how do you determine your diversion estimate? Uh, we use average weights um, for, we actually have a, a really detailed point of sale system where every single item is barcoded and so we have estimated weights by category uh, to a pretty detailed degree. Some stuff we've actually weighed and entered those in and other we, others we estimate. Mm -hmm. And how do you pay store employees and the people in the apprenticeship program? Do your sales cover the cost? Our sales cover about, it's close to 70% of our overall overhead. Um, we're, we're close to covering the cost of our labor, which is the biggest part of our expenses, um, but we're not quite there. Um, and uh, we're, we're a living wage employer, so our base rate is about twelve seventy-five an hour plus health benefits for a full-time employee. And then... Um, and that's set by, there's, a, there's these couple of agencies who set this living wage that, and we're, we're certified by them. Uh, for the apprentices, there's actually a, um, a union um, in our area that we're, we're in their area and they have a $10 an hour training rate and because it's a temporary position, our living wage, um, who were certified by a group, has allowed us to set a $10 an hour uh, rate for uh, apprentices in training. And this is for any of you that mentioned computers, TVs, appliances, and furniture. What happens to the materials that you are unable to move? Well, it's it, here in New York State, it's really volatile market. And I think commodities in general, um, plastics, CRT monitors, there's all sorts of um, problems with um, uh, what used to be some dollar, a few dollars for recycling and now is turning out to actually cost a lot of money to dispose of. And so um, uh, we recycle as much as we can. Uh, we do all sorts of things to try to give things away for free. Uh, but we do have some small percentage of stuff that actually does have to go into the dumpster. Uh, it's very small right now, but 
uh, as our volume grows, we expect uh, that volume to grow as well. And can someone talk about counties other than Hennepin County in Minnesota about what the counties and cities might be doing for reuse within the state? This is Colleen. Uh, we have uh, one of the areas uh, that's in a less populated area of the state. They have one of the grants they're working on is putting up a permanent reuse area for people. So when they come to a facility where they can actually get rid of things uh, for disposal, they can actually take them to the reuse center and people can shop those, um, shop there for reuse items instead of uh, throwing them away. So they've made it permanent and they've staffed it and they also do measurement there. So that's another thing that's done here. Um, and we have another county in the states also doing some fix-it clinics now. There's kind of a lot going on um, with different small programs that people are just making fit with their areas. And Colleen, you, you mentioned a database. Um, will that be shareable with other jurisdictions? It's going to be created in Retrack. I'm not sure if people out there have used that database before. So we are paying Retrack to create it and, and um, house that for us. So it won't, I mean, we'll be able to share the data from it, but I, it won't be something that other people can see. You'll need a password and um, access information to go into it, unfortunately. But it would be something then that um, all, all the information that went into creating it would be available for somebody else if they wanted to create one for themselves. And is anyone aware of reputable studies that have um, been developed to, uh, to measure the social benefit of reuse? I'm not really aware of a lot. That's a question that we've often asked ourselves. It sounds like, Diane, uh, I've noticed on one of your last slides the reuse industry uh, presentation from 2013 kind of looked a little bit at some of those social aspects of replacing um, public dollars spent on people who are now self-employed. Um, that looked like that looked like an interesting study. And um, Diane, did you want to add to that or? Um, yeah, I mean, ours was it was somewhat unscientific. We worked with a Cornell undergrad, and we really used uh, data just from our participants. We couldn't get clear data from the New York State Department of Labor, who sent us over to a different agency in our local Department of Social Services. No one really could give us what the actual costs to society are, and um, you know, there's uh, and then for social benefits, I see those as broader than just dollars. There's there's the empowerment and um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure how to measure that, but um, uh, I, I, personally, uh, my answer without a study is that um, even greater than the environmental and, and economic impacts, um, the empowerment and engagement um, um, uh, opportunities that reuse offers uh, are far more profound even, and uh, it's, I think it's a great bridge uh, for people who have been disenfranchised or underserved uh, to, to get back into uh, society and, and feel a sense of community. And for those of you dealing with fix-it cafes, the question is, are there low-hanging fruits that you would start with if you were a new cafe? Um, I can speak to that. This is Diane. Um, what we did, because we had no resources, uh, we did have space and we, we had easy access to tools, um, but we, um, we essentially did one press release and kind of public service announcement and we set up a Google spreadsheet and we said who's interested and, um, and that's actually still on our website, I think, uh, so people could look at it. Who's interested? Um, are you more interested in learning how to fix, or do you have skills that you could offer? And um, we were really uh, excited to find that we, th we thought we would have a lot of people who were interested in learning and not very many people who had skills, and it actually was the opposite. <laughs> we had a lot of people who were interested in, in sharing their skills, and that's been a... So there's been a lot of energy there without us really having to do much. We've had one volunteer who has committed to coming every time, but there's actually about four of them who, who come all the time. They just, they just love the uh, community feel of it, 
and um, and so we've now moved them from we used to have them behind the scenes, um, and now they're out in our store. So when people are shopping on Saturday afternoon in our busy reuse center, they see these people working on things, and we expect that that's going to kind of market itself. Um, so uh, I'd say looking for a partnership and seeing if someone would give up a small amount of retail space to, because they don't take up much space, but they generate a lot of excitement. <laughs> so here's a question for whoever mentioned toy lending libraries or tool lending libraries. Are they members of your reuse community? Or are there plans to make a toy lending library or a tool lending library part of the services you provide? Um, this is Diane. We don't currently have plans to do that just because of, we're afraid of the administrative burden, although we, we were just kind of joking that um, we kind of are a, a rental place in a sense because we keep getting materials back that we've sold. So we're just keeping our prices low and it's just a straightforward way for things to go out and come back. Um, but the actual tool lending library, I, I think Portland probably has one of the best models of multiple uh, tool lending libraries uh, that are, I, I believe, thriving. So and we do have a tool Christian. lending. We do have a tool lending library in Northeast Minneapolis, and I believe they have about 200 members, and they just started. Um, they just opened last year, or late 2014. Okay. I think that that's it for the questions. All right. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, any final comments from presenters? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I want to thank everyone for your time, panelists. Great job. And just to um, remind all participants that the recording and all the presentations will be up on the NERC website. And you'll receive a link to that, which is up on your screen right now, in a follow-up email that you'll receive from GoToWebinar. And if you have any final questions, go ahead and email me. My email address is in those um, email follow-ups. And um, also remember, if you can, please, to take the survey. It's a real short survey, and we would really appreciate your input. So thank you, everybody, for participating, and have a great day. Bye-bye.